It is Wednesday afternoon, January 13th, and we are picking up in our study of the, the, the events on God's calendar from the apocalypse to eternity future. We Last week, we're just tying up the end of the tribulation saints that are resurrected to reign with the Lord in his millennial kingdom. We saw that we, as the saints in what we call the church age, come back with the Lord to rule and reign with him. We saw this first resurrection had three phases, the first being the graves that were open at the time when Yeshua resurrected from the dead. Actually, the graves were split open at his death, but they did not come out of their graves till after he had resurrected. And then we saw the second phase of that first resurrection is the believers that are caught up at the time of the rapture. That's us, I trust, I pray, I hope. <laughs> and then our third phase is the tribulation saints that we looked at last week that will go into the kingdom to serve and rule with the Lord during the millennial kingdom that follows the, the tribulation period. What I didn't bring out last week, so to, to uh, bring it up quickly, is that when we have the, our bodily resurrection, when we are changed, when our mortality puts on immortality, when we are given that new glorious body like the Lord's, we, um, and why can I say it's like the Lord's? We'll see that as described in 1 John, 1 Yohanan, chapter 3 and verse 2, one of the little books on your way to Revelation. It's very close to Revelation. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, Beloved tells us, He's talking to believers. He's not going to call those who are the enemy of the Lord his beloved. Now we are children of God. And it's not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, when the Lord appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. So we are looking forward to a new body. We will not carry yeah. this body through all of eternity. We will be our glorified Praise selves. God. And I'm seeing everybody <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. We're all rejoicing. Yeah. We may not have had lupus for 30 years like Rose's dear sister who just was freed from that and is in the presence of the Lord. But no matter what, we're all suffering the consequences of, of sin on our bodies. The, the, as soon as we're born, we're starting to die. And we know that. So... It is wonderful, and I hear my mom over and over and over again saying, I can't wait to get my new body. <laughs> new mind and new body. So that is our blessed hope. Philippians 3 and verse 21 also tells us, and there it is, who will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body. Hey, I'll take that trade. I get to go from... A lowly condition to a glorious condition? Hallelujah. How does that happen? By the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He is so powerful. He can subject <clears throat> everything to him, even our bodies, to change them into a glorious body like his. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That body will not wear out through all of eternity. That body will not suffer. That body doesn't get hurt. You don't fall down and skin a knee, let alone have a, a kidney malfunction or have cancer invade the body or lupus or even diabetes, diabetes <laughs> which I don't minimize. That's, that's a horrible condition to live with. It's very hard on, on some that are dear to my heart that live with it and are trying to manage it. One day, you'll never think of that again. That's Praise glorious. Praise God. God, that's right, that is coming, that is our glorious hope. We don't go on forever like this, and I am so thankful for that. Mm -hmm. If you wonder why God took Adam and Eve out of the garden, it was so they would not eat at the tree of life that mm -hmm. would continue their living in that condition they were now finding themselves in. And if you think, well, you know, it's, it's their fault, well, can you imagine they know the contrast, or they knew the contrast. They had to live with that. So they, it wasn't something light and easy. That, that was quite a blow for them. Never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because they, oh, yeah. they knew the, yeah. the glorified and then lost mm -hmm. that. And yeah. we don't know how long. We don't know. It's not that they were, God created them one day and the very next day, I know, you know, they had time with God because he walked with them in the cool of the evening and he talked with them. 
And we don't know if, if they even made heaven. Well, I, the Bible doesn't say. Except God did the uh, sacrifice for them. You know, they he, he put clothes on them to cover them. Mm -hmm. The clothes came from an animal, which shows an animal sacrifice, which to me was him showing them the picture. He gave them the great prophecy of Genesis 3.15 that the one would come who would give the death blow to Satan. So I believe that, that uh, and even we see from their sons, Kion is the one that came, that you have to wonder where he is. Of all, Abel mm -hmm. made those sacrifices. He put his faith in God. Mm -hmm. He was obedient to God. Right. So even in, in their children that we see, it tells me they taught them. So oh. I, I believe. And there'd be no reason why they should be sentenced to not being allowed God's forgiveness. That would say that that sin was greater than God. That mm -hmm. he couldn't redeem that? No. No. My God can redeem. And really, honestly... <clears throat> We are very quick to judge. We want justice, and there's nothing wrong with that. But so often I do think, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, we, we really, we don't want God to mete out justice to us. We want to be forgiven. Why would we not want to extend that forgiveness to others? Right. You know, now, it, it, somebody will say, and I can hear it, so I'll head it off. You know, well, what about someone like Hitler? You mean to tell me he can kill mm -hmm. all those people and, mm -hmm. and then at the last minute of his life he can say, Dear Jesus, forgive me, and mm -hmm. everything's kosher? Well, honestly, it's the heart. It's not out yeah. of the mouth. It's the heart. The heart. A mm -hmm. heart that was able to do what he did, I don't believe, turns at the last minute. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't believe it does. No. I believe it's hardened. I believe it is led that it's given its allegiance to Satan the same way that we say when mm -hmm. they give their allegiance to the Antichrist and take his mark that we're told not even to pray for their salvation that they cannot be saved because they've they've more than thrown their hat in the ring with the Antichrist mm -hmm. so I don't worry about that I do believe those who are able to to do the horrors that they've done are in my mind beyond that that point where, you know, God says he gives them over to Satan, that, that you know, they, they, um, they get what they, they reap what they've sowed. So, but God is the judge. Mm -hmm. God is fair. God is just. Well, look at Paul. God he killed all those Christians, but he gave his heart to the look Lord. At, look at became Paul. became a great follower of the Lord. All Paul yeah. went from hunting them down and persecuting mm -hmm. them to being one of them. Yes, mm -hmm. look at that. And look at the thief on the cross. It was his last moments. He was a thief. He deserved his punishment. He admitted such. Hey, you and I to the other thief, we deserve this. This one doesn't. So that shows a heart repentance and a change of heart. And that's why the Lord could say to him, you will be with me in paradise. So God is gracious. He is loving. He is forgiving. But he is fair and just and right in his ruling. And when we see it from his perspective, we will not question it. We will know God was right and right on. Is that a question, Rowena? Yes. Okay. Let's let Rowena come in and hear your question. Can you clarify again the first phase of the resurrection? Sure. Is that the Lord and the rest of the Old Testament saints? So and the Old Testament saints also come with us in the second phase, where, which we call the rapture. Some of the Old Testament saints raised at the time after Yeshua Jesus raised. Okay, it's Matthew 27, 51 to 53. We read it last time, so I won't read it this time. But these are the verses that make it very clear that the graves were open, but they did not come out of those graves until after the Lord resurrected. He is the first fruits. He is the first resurrected. Okay, so we make it clear he has that, that place of preeminence. But some of the graves were open, and these that were open were people that went into the city and testified to the resurrection power. If you knew that you had buried your loved one and three weeks later they came knocking at your door, <laughs> wow, something miraculous has happened and I believe that helped them realize that, that something major had happened, exactly what God had foretold, that he would not allow his Holy One to see corruption, which meant by the fourth day his Holy One, the Lord Yeshua Jesus, had to raise from the dead because corruption starts on the fourth day. 
So that, that besides the fact that, that the Lord himself had said he'd be in the heart of the earth the three days and three nights like Jonah was in the heart of the, the big fish. We often say, well, but the scripture says big fish. Anyway, um, so the first phase of the resurrection, and we will later talk about the other resurrection. The second resurrection is for all those who will stand in judgment to go into an eternity apart from the Lord. Uh, we'll talk about that later when we come to it. It's not that far off in our following, um, following the order of the events. So the first phase, first fruits of the first phase is Yeshua Jesus, and then those... I, I imagine few in number. I mean, compared to all who had died for so long, they're few in number. But those who, who he allowed out of those graves to be a testimony to the people around them. Now, some believe that all the Old Testament saints raised at that time. I kind of don't think so. I can't be 100% dogmatic. But Daniel 12, Daniel talks about that there'd be a day when some would raise to everlasting judgment and others to everlasting life. And the timing that it is talking about is after the, tribu uh, yeah, after the tribulation period when we're looking at the kingdom, that some would be raised. I, maybe it even, it doesn't say to go into the kingdom. But anyway, when you look at those verses, it gives me an idea that a good majority of what the Old Testament saints, we'll call them that, may be raised at that point in time that they will be raised in relation to the millennial kingdom. Now, again, I cannot be dogmatic, and if you want to believe that when the, the graves are open that it was all, it doesn't say. It just it doesn't make it that clear. Uh, but as you begin to process and the thoughts and other thoughts that will come to you, I think you will see, like me, that it, it sounds more like um, the Old Testament saints, what we see in Revelation also that's not coming to mind right now, scripture and verse. But it, it gives me the idea that that's later. Also, let me give you this fact. We know after Yeshua raised from the dead, we know that he was seen by Miriam, Mary, at the garden too. We know that he called her by name. She turned and she wanted to cling to him. And he told her to stop clinging, that he hadn't yet ascended to his father, and to go tell his Talmudim that he had raised. Then when we see him a little later, very short in time, with some other women, he lets them cling, he lets them hold on to him, and nothing is said about, wait, i got to go to my father, let me go do what I need to do, so to speak. In that time when he went to see his father is when we believe he put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, accomplishing the openness of heaven for us as believers so that now we don't go into the heart of the earth, into the paradise side of Sheol. We go immediately into the presence of the Lord. That's why Sheol, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, the Lord's not in the heart of the earth. He was for three days and three nights, but he's not down there. He's in heaven. When he raised and took his blood ahead and put it on the mercy seat, it's also believed from Ephesians chapter 4, I believe. Um, I believe it's Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Um, we believe that he emptied the paradise side and took that into the heavens. Now, if he did that, there, in essence, is the tribulation, I mean, I'm sorry, the Old Testament saints being transferred into heaven, but we still will see the tribulation saints, we still will see the Old Testament saints referred to at this millennial time. So, um, I believe the heart of the earth was emptied out, but, but probably like those who died before us are waiting to get that new body for the time when, when the Lord says, now we're changed, and we put on that, we get that new body. They have an intermittent, and it's not something that's unidentifiable. It's not a spirit, no, no, you know, nothing that can be seen, because we have, um, like Moses and Elijah, being seen, Moshe and Eliyahu, being seen in glorification with Yeshua when he was seen in his glory, Matthew 17. They knew him. They saw him, or them, I'm sorry. They, they knew it was Moses and Elijah. They saw bodies. They didn't see spirits. So 
Um, you could touch them. You could touch them, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, the difference when we get the Lord's body, when we're transformed into that, and for us it does happen at the rapture, I believe that that may be when these others are. That's when the, the dead in Christ rise first. Well, that's that body being raised up, because that's all that's in the grave is the body. And those that died many years ago is ashes. Those who died recently could still have, you know, body intact. But um, all of those... <clears throat> are raised to be changed immediately into the body like the Lord so that we will be able to live forever as I've already described. When Yeshua showed up in the upper room to his Talmudim, he didn't open and close the door. He suddenly appeared. We will be able to suddenly appear. We won't need to get on a plane or a car or a train to get to a location. We will be we'll able to just... We'll be there. <laughs> in essence, think it and be there. Yes, yes. Okay. Ephesians. Cool. <laughs> I want to say I'm Ephesians four. Oh, and yeah. And we go through walls too, can't we? Yes. Yeah. It just suddenly appeared. That's what he did. Uh, yes, and it is Ephesians four eight through ten. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, and we're talking about the Lord, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. Now. Uh, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same that also ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Okay, so this is a description of the Lord and what he is saying is he has ascended on high. Before he ascended on high, he went into the lower parts of the earth. That was the three days he spent in the, the grave and in Sheol, in the paradise side, not in the suffering side. He did not go suffer the flames of hell as people teach. He went into the paradise side. He told the thief, you'll be with me in paradise. When he finished his work on the cross, he said, it is finished. Tetelestai. He didn't say, now let me go suffer and come out of the suffering for you. His suffering was over. It was done. When he, he breathed his last, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Do you think God is in hell? Do you think that the spirit of the Lord went to the Father in hell? Of course not. No one would think that. So using logic, we realize he went into the paradise side where the spirit of the Lord was, or, or the, the Ruach Kodesh spirit, which is the, the other form of, of our triune God. So he went into the lower parts first. Then it says he led captivity captive. If you don't know what those words mean, that leaves you in the dark. But if you know that that was terminology used when a, um, a, a okay, a kingdom, let's call it a kingdom, goes to war, a country, okay, a country goes to war, they do battle, there's, there's a team that wins, okay? The team that wins, the, the leader of the one who took them in, the, the leader of the army, I'm really fighting for words, I'm sorry. The, the leader of the, the army, the forces that won the battle, is going to come on a horse. He's going to come parading through the main street of the town. Behind him is going to be his soldiers that battled with him. Behind them is going to be all of the people that they've caught captive now that are their slaves. And behind that is all the booty that they are going to now have, that they, they ransacked the country that they just got victory from. That was called leading captivity captive because they were leading those captives through. They're now in, in you know, the prisoners of the team that won. So when the Lord led captivity captive, he took his booty. You know what his booty was? All those who have been in Sha'ol, in the paradise side, all those who put their faith in that one day that was coming. From the first one who, who died, which I believe was of all Abel, until the very last one that had gone into the heart of the earth, which I guess would be the thief, because he went in at the time that Yeshua went in. Unless, you know, in those next couple days. But anyway, you get my point. He emptied it out. That's his, captive, his, his captives. They're the Lord's captives. He took them behind him into the heavens. He paraded right through Satan's territory. Mm -hmm. And... Satan couldn't do a thing about it. He's the prince of the power of the air, but the Lord went right through that air with his captive. 
Okay, it's not nice, but they could, they could, if it was slow enough, they could go nah, 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 yeah. on the way up because they were, they could stick their finger in the eye of Satan, and he deserves it. Okay, that he didn't get him. The Lord won the victory, brought his entourage into the heavens where they are now present with the Lord, awaiting well rejoicing and, and fellowshipping and worshiping and, and what all not I mean they don't know they're waiting we're waiting to join them let me let me make it clear where we wait to join them so I believe the paradise sign was emptied out I don't believe anyone is down in the paradise heart of the earth except on the suffering side that's not been emptied out that will not be emptied out till it stands it's emptied out to be um, judged at the great white throne judgment. That's the second resurrection. That's what we'll talk about when we get there. I'll give you the scriptures that go with it. And they go into their eternal punishment, the degree of suffering that they will have for the rest of eternity. Okay? So, first resurrection, first phase, is the Lord resurrecting, and then those graves that opened, and I think good chance that all paradise was emptied out right behind, three days later, was, was emptied out, you know, right behind when the Lord went into the heavens. Um, again, they're still waiting this new body, and the way that it sounds in Daniel 12, I can't be 100% dogmatic, but it sounds to me like the Old Testament saints must come back in a maybe a slightly different way than those of us who were, were raptured. Maybe they're coming in this direction, we're coming in this direction. I don't know. It's a little hard to say it real clearly, but I think that I'm making myself clear enough. Look at the scriptures discern for yourself. The time of rapture is the second phase of that first resurrection. And that's when we get read First Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. This is when... Um, Okay, sorry, I saw a note here. Um, let me sidetrack you for just a moment. Remember we read 1 John 3, 2, the one that said that, that uh, we, it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know when he appears, we will be like him. Okay, remember I said that um, they could see Moshe. They could see Eliyahu. I want to make sure that I make it clear. There is a temporary body. I'm going to put it that way, that, that they have. Our loved ones now that we're talking about, the second phase, at the rapture, when it says the dead in Christ rise first, it's the, grave, it's the body out of the grave that comes up, but the, the person in an intermittent body of some sort, the spirit of that person, has been in heaven with the Lord, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and we know where he is, okay? So there's phase two. At that point in time, when we're caught up also, and we're caught up split, not even a split second after the dead in Christ rise first. Only God can move it so fast that it can't be measured, and yet you can say the dead in Christ raised and then we raised. Okay, but it's so fast, it's, it's yeah. all like at the same split second for us. Life. It's at that point that we're given that new body, that the Lord says, now we are, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and following, tells us that mortality puts on immortality, and this uh, is where 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that we will be um, changed like him. Um, let me run over there real fast and give you just the end of it, not all of it. 1 Thessalonians, you want to read verses 4, chapter 4, you want to read verses uh, 13 to 18. But I'm going to read for you just at the end. Um, then we who are alive and remain, verse 17, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord, okay? So now we're coming into the time when we will have our permanence with the Lord forever. So I believe that's when 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51 to 54, and I'm running over there because I want to make sure that I make this all clear. First, whoops, 1 Corinthians 15:51 tells us that this isn't going to happen to everybody. This happens to the believers. Behold, I'm telling you a mystery. Mystery in Scripture means something that hasn't been revealed until now. Okay, this is Shaul Paul speaking. He was the one that the Lord gave the Scripture, the understanding of the rapture, 
who gave it to us, okay? When you go back into, um, and I hate to call Old Testament times, but for sake of understanding, we'll put it that way, they did not know about a rapture. They weren't taught about a rapture. We see that in Matthew 24 when the Lord's talking to the Talmudim, to his Jewish followers. And remember, the Old Testament scriptures are all the Jewish history, the Jewish timeline. They're all in relation to Israel because they're in relation to the Messiah who is born into that Jewish nation in his physical body who is going to fulfill all the promises to Israel that we're going to see in the Millennial Kingdom as soon as we get to it, which we're right on the heels of in more ways than one. <laughs> but anyway, so um, I don't want to derail my thought here. So, um, and I did that. Um, oh, okay. That, that in the Old Testament, we don't see the teaching of the rapture. That's given to those in the church age. It's like a separation, an interruption. That's a better word. It's an interruption. God is working with Israel always but Israel is not the head nation right now. And Israel will not be head nation until the Lord comes back to rule and reign from Israel. And that's when she'll be raised up to that preeminence. Right now, we're living in the time called the time of the Gentiles. We saw that that was clear from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the image, the head of gold, silver, bronze. Remember, we can go through time from Babylon all the way to the revived Roman Empire that will be in control when the Lord returns and the stone cut out without hands, which is the picture of the Lord. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm going to try holding it up. Pam's always got it. I'm going to try holding it up. I don't know if you can read that all, but that's your, your head of gold, the Babylon Empire, 606 B.C. The silver represented Medo Media, Persia, 536 B.C. The bronze was the Greek Empire of 330 B.C. The iron was Roman Empire, 27 B.C. And that was in, in control when, um, oh, the glare is bad, sorry. When um, the Messiah walked on this earth in his human form. And then the iron and clay, the mixture, is the end times. Each one being a little less. I think I'm being told to back up a little. Okay, if you didn't get it, you can get it from me. Just let me know and I'll get it to you in another way. But each being a little less in strength, a little less in uh, value. And we see all the way down, but the stone finishes off that, that image. It crumbles, it shatters. It's more than Humpty Dumpty that took a great fall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put them back together again. Mm -hmm. It is shattered. The stone grows up and fills the face of the earth as a picture. Mm -hmm. The stone being cut out without hands, picture of virgin birth. When it becomes filling the earth, it becomes a kingdom, it becomes the kingdom. It's the kingdom of the Lord. What has been promised to Israel, to the Jewish nation, throughout our Old Testament scriptures, many times in prophecy, not fulfilled yet. But at this point, every promise will be fulfilled. We're going to talk more about that as we get into the millennium, which is just about here. So we see that when he taught to Israel, they didn't know about the interruption to this image. They didn't know about the time that, that we call the church age, which began when the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, was given to indwell men permanently until their home in heaven with him. Remember, in Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit would come on a person for them to do a work for the Lord, and then the Holy Spirit would depart from them. That's why you have David, David in the Psalms pray, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. But you never read Shaul Paul tell us, who gives us our marching orders in the church age, he, he never tells us to pray that the Holy Spirit won't leave us. On the contrary, he tells us in Ephesians 1, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, until you are home in heaven with the Lord, you are sealed. You are as good as married to him. You can't be separated from him, he from you. There's a change there to that body that was sealed with the Holy Spirit, starting with what we call Pentecost, what, what uh, was the tongues of fire coming on the men. They were able to speak in languages they hadn't studied. What did they speak? The gospel. It was the beginning of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. From the moment that that started, that's called the beginning of the church age, till we are raptured up. That's a church age period where God has said, in essence, and this is Romans 1, in essence, I've set aside Israel. 
I have not rejected her. I have not said it's over. I have not said I'm done with her. But I've set her aside. Why? Because she's refused to turn to her Messiah. She's refused to believe in her Messiah. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, I'm going to raise up another people for myself. I'm going to make you jealous with those people mm -hmm. because you're going to see them love me, embrace me, and mm -hmm. want me, and you had me first, but you rejected me. Mm -hmm. So when you see that they picked up something, wow, wait a minute. That was valuable. That was something I want. And the Jewish people will turn back to receive also the blessings that God has promised to those who are believers in this church age, which is to be raptured when it ends and go into the presence of the Lord forever. So it was something given to Shaul Paul because he's teaching the, the time of the Gentiles that we're in. He's teaching that end time about how we are to live and move and have our being. We, like I say, we get our marching orders from his books, okay? We don't go under the law. We don't keep the law. That was a period of time in Israel's history. When we get into the tribulation period, we won't go into it now because we've already done it, but we saw that they were back under the law. They're keeping the law again. They're going to even reinstitute the sacrificial system again because that's what God had told Israel. This is your plan and what you are to do. We see that culminate in the coming of their Messiah second time second coming not to be confused with the rapture two different events the rapture he comes for his saints for the believers calls them up meets them in the air second coming he comes to the nation of israel with his saints feet all the way down on the mount of olives where he's put his footprints the first time mm -hmm. that's why it can be called a second coming the first time as the suffering servant to deal with the sin issue. The second time as the reigning king to deal with the kingly issues and promises. So we have a separation. Shaul Paul raised up to tell us about this rapture. And that's why he says, I'm telling you a mystery. Verse 51. We will not all sleep. A nice way of saying we won't all die. Okay? But we all will be changed. Now 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us also that we're being changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. That means they can't perish again. And we will be changed. For the perishable must put on imperishable. The mortal must put on immortality. That's us. We get rid of what's dying off. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on the mortality, then will come about the saying that's written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Mm -hmm. The sting of death is sin. Sin's going to be done away with. It's not going to be power in our lives. And the power of sin is the law. The law lets them know where they have sinned. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That tells us, in that rapture, these two par um, scripture passages go together, that in that rapture, we're changed into the imperishable, the immortal. Mm -hmm. And we go on in an eternity in that body. That's the second phase of this first resurrection. The third phase is, we're going to go through it, not us, I'm sorry, let me not phrase it that way, the earth is going to go through a seven-year tribulation period. During that time, we know right from the get-go, 144,000 are raised up. We call them Jewish Billy Grahams, Jewish evangelists that are going to be carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. That means 144,000 Jewish people got saved after the rapture. Because if they were saved prior to the rapture, they would have gone up with the Lord. Nowhere do we read that the rapture says, these will be raptured and these won't be. Mm -hmm. So they get saved after. How's that going to happen? You and I right now are sharing our faith with Jewish people who have not yet believed. But they've not made a final um, decision commitment. against the Lord. Commitment. commitment. They've not turned so hardened that they'll never turn to the Lord. 
some of them we've even shared, hey, if we disappear, this is what you need to know. So when we do disappear in rapture, and they realize, or for those who just know, well, they, they talk about this Bible. Maybe I better get in here and read what it has to say. They will come to saving faith. They will get saved. They're going to be lit on fire for the Lord. They're going to take that gospel message out. And we're told in Revelation, people from every time, every nation, every tribe will come to saving faith. There's going to be so many saved during the tribulation that it calls them a myriad of numbers in seeing them under the throne because the ones under the throne anyway have been beheaded for their faith. They're going to suffer greatly for their faith. They're going to lose their lives for their faith, but they stay with their faith because their faith is true. And just as we see martyrs throughout time that, that stayed true to the Lord, they stayed true and they lost their lives for it. It will not be an easy time. It will not be a pretty picture. We want to get everybody saved we can on this side of the tribulation so they don't have to go through that. But in the tribulation, there will be a multitude that are saved. Now, the same way when we say right now we bury a believer, we put their body in the grave, and we know that their spirit went to be with the Lord. During the tribulation, it will still be the same way. The body will get buried, but the spirit's been released to go be with the Lord. So, at this, at this um, time when we come back, we've got new ones that have come back also with us, all called his saints, okay? What about the ones on the earth who weren't beheaded? Because there will be some who will make it through the tribulation, okay? What about those? There's going to be mixed in that number, those who believe and those who don't believe. Well, what we're being told is at the end of the tribulation, this is the third phase, Revelation 20 and verse 4. The third phase of the first resurrection, Revelation 20 and verse 4 says, Then I saw thrones. They that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. So there's thrones set up on this earth, smaller than the Lord's great throne, but they're going to be judging with the Lord. We know that. We'll talk about who that is in a little bit also. But then it says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or the image. So now we know we're talking about tribulation saints. They had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hands. And they came to life. So see, they died. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So the third phase of the first resurrection is these tribulation saints that did die. They were beheaded, but they've been raised up to, to, uh, to uh, judge with the Lord during the millennial time. Okay, so they're the third phase of the first resurrection. Those who were raised at the time that the graves were opened, went right after Yeshua raised, they came out of the graves. We have those. We have those that go up in the rapture. And we have those that go up during the tribulation. They're all in the first phase of the first resurrection. Okay? Everybody clear? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Is it on this? 144,000. Okay. Are they martyrs or will they just be raptured up like Elijah was? They are sealed with uh, a mark from, from the Lord, sealed mm -hmm. in their forehead. That's mm -hmm. why, what do you think Satan does when he has the Antichrist say, put the mark in the forehead? He's mimicking, he's counterfeiting again. Mm -hmm. They are marked so that they cannot, their life cannot be taken from them. They're sealed and protected until their work is done. If that means that they live out the whole seven years because their work isn't finished to the end, then they will be those that I'm going to be talking about next. If they finish their job, five years into the tribulation, and then they're, they're martyred, mm -hmm. then their spirit's gone to heaven. They're part of the, so what we see So they will be martyred after their work is done. Yes, and I, I don't know that they all will be, because maybe they won't be. Maybe they live out the whole time. I don't know when their work is done. It mm -hmm. doesn't tell us. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the 144,000 may live out the seven years, or they may live out only part of it. I don't know. It doesn't say. It just makes it clear that until their work is finished, they can't be harmed. So they're, they're better than Superman who had kryptonite to worry about. They have nothing to worry about. 
but when their work is done, then they can be put to death. The two witnesses are an example of that. Mm -hmm. They, fire came out of heaven by their command. They did all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But when their work was done, <coughs> they were put to death. Mm -hmm. They lay dead on the ground for three and a half days mm -hmm. without their bodies being buried because the people were dancing and rejoicing yeah. and giving gifts and celebrating and yeah. saying, ha, ha, the ones who, who pricked our conscience, the ones who bothered us, now look at them. <laughs> I love how the Lord has the last word. I'd give anything to, be, to see the shock on those faces when suddenly those bodies pop up, come back to life, yeah, and I'm are ascended in heaven right smack oh, in I'd front of them. How are they going to excuse that one? <laughs> what are they going that. to say then? He who laughs last, and I see the Lord That's laughing right. in, you know, Psalm 2 tells us that, that he laughs in the heavens at us. Mm -hmm. Not us, but, you know. So, <clears throat> the two witnesses could be a great example of what happens with the 144,000 when the work is done. But I don't know, because we're not told the work is done at a certain point. We're not told their end. We're only told that the, the gospel message will go to the ends of the earth, and then the, the, the return of the Lord will be. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so... Um, so the answer is that they probably will be martyred. I think I think at least some will be. <clears throat> I, I, you know, I'm presuming, but I'm kind of thinking probably not all. And we will talk about those who were not martyred very, very shortly. Let me give you a couple of verses first that lead into that, okay? <laughs> um, I see a couple of hands up again. Are these questions? Okay, Rhonda, go for it. She's turned off. She's, yeah, he's trying to unmute her. Unmute yourself now. Okay. There you go, you're on. My question has to do with the transfiguration when you were talking about Moses and Elijah. Mm -hmm. What state are they in? Because, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord, are they, is, is, is there a tall one? I thought you couldn't talk to spirits after, you know, that they go. So what's going on here? Moses, Moshe and Eliyahu had a very special um occurrence. Let me put it that way. This is not the common. This is not what happens with all. But the Lord said in Matthew 16, he said, there would be some here that won't die until they see the Son of Man in all his glory. Okay? Now, the Son of Man is not returned in all his glory yet. And we're in 2021. When he said these words, we're in the 30s A.D. So we're talking, let's just round it off and say 2,000 years since the Lord said that. Now, anybody know a 2,000-year-old person? <laughs> I think we've seen some old people. Yeah, I saw someone that, that was on the news <laughs> for turning 100 a day or two ago. He looked wonderful. But most at 100 don't look as good as he no. did, let alone 1,000 or 2,000. So obviously... That generation, the people that, that heard Yeshua say that, are no longer alive. So something has to have happened. Well, when you remember that our <coughs> books divided into chapters and verses are for our sake, it was one long story that was being given. And you notice that chapter 17 from the Greek could start with the word and, which when we use the word and, that's a conjunction meaning we're connecting these two as continuing, regardless of whether that word was there or not, is a continuation. So in chapter 16, we're being told some are going to see him in his glory. In chapter 17, we get that sneak peek. We have the transfiguration of the Lord. Now remember, he has not yet suffered on the cross. He's not yet died. He's not yet resurrected in his resurrection body, which is flesh and bone. He says that to Thomas. I think it's to Thomas he says it. It's made clear in the Gospels that after the resurrection, he was flesh and bone. Now today, we're, we're flesh, blood, and bone. The life of the flesh is in the blood. If George Washington's era had only read and believed in Scripture, they wouldn't have leaked him dry. They wouldn't have brought his death on. But they took his blood out thinking his blood was bad, and they leaked the life out of him. We know that we cannot exist without blood. If, if somebody comes and drains all your blood out of you, you are dead. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'm told the, the beautiful, sweet little story. A brother and sister family, missionary family, on a mission field where they only had the, the rudimentary type hospital situation. His sister, the sister had gotten hurt badly and needed blood. And they knew that the brother and sister had matching blood. So they asked the, the little boy, mom and dad are right there, the doctor's right there, and they asked him for permission to take blood from him to give to his sister so that she could, could live, so she would survive. And he, he's thinking about this. This is a lot for a little guy to, to understand. His eyes are, are big and his little lips quivering. And, and he finally says, okay, he, he agrees. And everybody thinks he's just, you know, scared of the transfusion, scared of, of the yeah. big word and what's going on. Well, he hadn't fully understood. And as they started the blood into his sister, he said to his mom and dad, so when do I die? He literally was willing to give his life up for his, his sister to live. He understood the life of the flesh is in the blood. He just didn't realize a transfusion wasn't going to take his whole life out of him. It was only going to be a small amount that God has made us so wonderfully that he would replenish. But our Lord gave all his blood. His blood was poured out. We're told the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar for the remission of sins, for without the shedding of blood... There is no remission of sin. That's Viagra, Leviticus 17, 11, and another verse that I've combined together. But anyway, um, we know that shed blood. We know when they pierced his side that the blood and the water flowed out, showing his heart was broken, showing he was dead. Remember, it was the blood that had to be put on that mercy seat. And God said, I put it on the mercy seat for you. Well, when did God do it? He did it in the person of Yeshua. And he didn't do it on the earthly mercy seat in Jerusalem. He did it on the heavenly that the earthly was patterned after. That's why heaven can now be open and people could go directly into heaven. Because now sin is removed. Now sin is washed away. Before that blood was put on the mercy seat, it was only covered. It was only a picture of what would come. So that's why until the Lord resurrected and put his blood on the mercy seat and said, this is for all mankind, that's why people couldn't go into heaven. They could go into the paradise site that God prepared for them, but they were not sinless yet. They, were, they, they had pledged, done this in faith, believing. Now it had happened. Now the blood's there. Now heaven can be open. Now we go. So there's our change. And so... Um, and the skin, too. Our skin rots. And our so skin rots. So we're going to have now. a new material coming. Yes, yes. The Lord, his, his, he came through the walls and he didn't get bruised and, and beat up. He, you, you know, no. Yes. The new body is a new body also. <clears throat> That is flesh and bone, because he, he told them, he told Thomas, feel me, you know, that, that he is flesh and bone. They could see him. Okay, so, now back to my, answering my question. We're back to the transfiguration now. He hasn't died and risen yet and received himself even the new body that he's chosen to live in for all of eternity. Because once he put on human form, he, he doesn't ever slip out of that. We see him as who he is with the piercings in his hands and his feet. We see him return from heaven that way. We see that Israel realizes and mourns for him because they see the piercings. They know, wow, this is the one that we pierce. They, they come to that understanding. Mm -hmm. So back to this time, this is a picture foreshadowing what would come when we would see the Lord return in his glory. Mm -hmm. In that glorification, we also know we will be like him. We will be in his glory when we're with him forever. That is what Moshe and Eliyahu got a taste of also. They were shown to us in that glory. Even though their bodies had decayed, Moshe was buried only where God knows. Um, I, and I can't say that Eliyahu, Elijah, had decayed because he was taken up in uh, the chariot, you know, that he was transfigured into heaven, but his body, and, and, and even when he was transfigured into heaven, he went up into, we say into heaven, but his soul had gone into paradise, because he didn't sit in heaven with God waiting for everybody else to catch up, no, he had to have gone into the heart of the earth, but we see it in, you know, 
we say heaven's up here. Well, if heaven's up here right now, where's heaven tomorrow morning? <laughs> you know, and what about Australia that's down below me that's pointing in the other direction where I'd say hell was? You know, we use north and south in that way. The heaven is not, you know, it, it's, and I believe it's even as close as we just can't see it. But it's, it's you know, surrounding us because it's more than than what, what we are uh, realizing. Anyway, so Moshe and Eliyahu received a, a, they got to taste it in a way, the same way the Lord tasted that glorification again, even though he still was in his human body waiting that time at death, burial, and resurrection. So it was a pre preview. That's a good way to put it. It was a preview of what it would be like. I'm going to tip my hand here. You can disagree with me. I've got one here I love who does disagree with me, and that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> I believe the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. They're going to be seen in human form again. They're going to live on this earth again, whether it's the two of them or whoever it is. But believing these are two witnesses that have come back from the past, they're going to live in human bodies again because they're going to be able to be killed. So, see, there are exceptions. Obviously, it was an exception for them to be in their, in their glorification stat, status when they were seen It recorded in Matthew 17. They're going to, if they are the same, and I believe they are, they're going to have that human body that can be put to death again. That's an exception to the rule. Lazarus died twice. He was resurrected four days later. He died again because I don't see Lazarus walking around on this earth either. And believe me, if we had a 2,000-year-old man on the face of this earth, the news media would be covering it. <laughs> um, we, anyone who was raised from the dead, Dorcas, uh, the little boy, the, the widow's son, Jairus' daughter, we have exceptions to roles. So... In the exception, Moshe and Eliyahu got to put on that glorification and got to be seen in that glory. And it fulfilled Matthew 16 where the Lord said, some of you are going to see it. Who got to see it? Peter, James, and John. His inner circle got to see it. I believe God took them in to see it because more is going to be required of them. They're going to be our giants raising up and carrying on after Yeshua goes into heaven. So God... The Lord was privy uh, with them, giving them more than he gave to the others. So they, they saw, they, they tasted, but they didn't get to keep it because I believe that, that they're going to come back even into human form, which is amazing. <coughs> but that's my God. If he can create Adam out of the dust of the earth, he can certainly put Moshe and Eliyahu's spirits back into a human body. And whoever is the two witnesses he does that for, I just happen to believe those are the two. So, did I follow my thought all the way through? Are we okay? Sort of. Go ahead, Rhonda. Go ahead. We'll follow through with you. My, my thing is, I'll just focus on Moses because we know Elijah didn't die. Right. You know, right. But Moses, he died, right? We just right. don't know where he was buried, right? Right. 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 Yes. So he died and he was in Shoal, right? His spirit in Shoal, yes. Yes. His body and spirit in Shoal. Not, well, the body not because the body was buried somewhere by God, somewhere on the earth. The same way we bury a body today, the spirit is what leaves the body. The spirit goes okay. into wherever. Okay, so the, the body was somewhere we didn't know, and the spirit was in, the, in Shoal. Mm hmm. And so when the transfiguration happened, mm -hmm. the body is there or the spirit and the body is there? What's there? In the transfiguration, I believe the spirit and the body were reunited. And reunited in a way that we will see when we're reunited with the Lord in glorification. The, the, in the transfiguration, it's a glorification. It's not the way that we are now. So, you know, they saw a glowing Moshe and Eliyahu, but they could see them. That's what I'm stressing. They could see them. It wasn't just a spirit standing there, you know, like, like you see on, on TV. They'll show you a spirit with color or something so you know the spirit's there. No, this was spirit and body that was there. 
Okay? I yes. just had a thought image. Oh, Moshe's body. The body being buried by God. Remember the scripture tells us that Satan was arguing for the body of Moshe. They were fighting over it. Why would he even care? That's why I believe Moses is the other one who comes back um, to, to uh, or the one, you know, one of the two witnesses, because God still had use for that body. He had use for that body at the transfiguration, and he'll have use for that body during the tribulation period. So, you know, and Satan knows. He knows what's coming. If, you, if we know, you think he doesn't. He just doesn't believe it's going to go out the way that, that the, the Lord said. He believes he can change scripture. I got news for him. <laughs> Okay, are we okay? I'm like Joyce said, then what do we do with Enoch? Because nothing's ever mentioned about him and he has to die too, you know? The same way Lazarus had to die twice, Jairus' daughter died twice, um, mm. the, the widow's son died twice, we have exceptions to rules. Mm. So there's no problem with that. It's, that's just how God did it. Mm. Wow. Yeah. But you're okay. You doesn't, can... doesn't teach. Doesn't teach how he died. No, yeah. he. I don't believe that he did. I believe he's an exception yeah. to the rule. Yeah. It's appointed in a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the ones who die twice? Mm -hmm. It doesn't say in there. Oh, except for these who are going to die twice. And it also doesn't say except for Enoch, who I believe we don't read of his death because he is a picture of the rapture. He is a picture of of us. What about all of us when we're caught up in, to meet the Lord in the air before we die? All of us won't have died. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us won't have died. And that happens yeah. before the yeah, two every, witnesses come back. Everybody must die. Everybody must die. The ones who go in rapture, when do they die? Well, I'm not talking in the Old Testament. They didn't teach rapture in the New Testament. In the Old Testament they didn't the teach New. the rapture, but it's the same principle. If we don't die that go in the rapture, and mm -hmm. Enoch is a picture of the rapture, then that's why we don't read of his dying. Now, he may have died and God buried his body. I'm not telling you scripture doesn't tell us, but I don't mm -hmm. believe that because I believe God used him to be a picture of us in the rapture. And God's not going to bury all our bodies and take our spirits. We're caught up alive, it mm -hmm. tells us. The dead are raised, and we who are alive are raised. So the same way that you know, we... You think that's two different events? Like, that, that's a different than, than the other one? You think they're both the same? What two events? Because they didn't teach rapture in the old Bible. Right. I believe Enoch is and, a uh, picture of. But you, you're thinking he's a picture He's a of, picture of. Even though they didn't teach the rapture in the Old Testament. What about, well, yeah, what about Elijah? He didn't die either. No. He's he caught up also. Elijah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why picture. they connect them together because neither one died. Yeah. Right, but when you look at what they do, and then you look at the transfiguration, <coughs> and you look at the contention, it says to me it's Moses and Elijah. But again, mm -hmm. you're free to think that you've got yeah. good reason. Hey, Barry Stone teaches that it's uh, Enoch too. Doesn't and he he teaches nothing but on prophecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he but believes again, it's Enoch too. Get it from scripture. You have your scripture in the way you see it and why you, you know, so you're free to believe that. Oh, okay. And we'll find out one day. Yeah, we'll, we'll be surprised. <laughs> one of us will be. <laughs> we'll be yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. That's where we're free to disagree. That's okay. It's not going to change it. It's okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's why I say. It's okay to agree to disagree. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The only thing we can't agree to disagree on is salvation. That's what yeah, matters. Yeah, that one, one way that only. One's very and by important. the way, when I bring out that, that different, yeah, when I bring out that different program that God is going with Israel and the interruption that the church is, still, from a dome to the last human, there's one way of salvation. There's only one way for Israel. <clears throat> For the Gentiles, for the church age, for the age of law, for the age of promise, for the age of conscience, for the age of the tribulation, whatever we're in, there's only one way of salvation. Mm -hmm. Period. That's Yeshua and Jesus the same with the rapture, and the pre post or mid. Uh, it's important. It's important, but not like salvation. It's not important. Salvation, salvation. is more important. Yes, yeah. absolutely, because you'll miss it totally if you're not saved. Right. Okay. Any other questions out there? I don't. Rowena, did you get and all your way, questions I'm answered? <laughs> you're good. Okay. I'm not poster mid. I'm pre. <laughs> <laughs> I can agree with that with you. <laughs> okay. No other questions. 
Okay, then let's keep moving on this thought. Look with me at Matthew 19, 28. I forgot we were going there. I would have turned us there when we did Matthew 16 and 17, but that's okay. Matthew 19 and verse 28. Now, this is Yeshua talking to his Talmudim, to his disciples as you call them. Okay? <clears throat> this is what he's telling the leaders in Israel. Okay? Yeshua Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me. Okay? Now he's defined it. He's talking to believing Israel. He's talking to his, like I say, specifically his Talmudim, because we're going to get down to it being that specific. Um, <clears throat> truly I say to you, to, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. Okay, regeneration, that, that's when God has, when the new program is on. The Lord is going to be sitting on his throne. Okay, we know that's millennium. So the regeneration of the, the world at that time in that sense. When the Son of Man is sitting on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones. Okay, twelve Talmudim representing Israel, they're going to sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Does that sound very Jewish? <laughs> I don't think you can get a whole lot more Jewish yeah. than a Jewish, well, God-man. I'll put it that way because his humanness, he's Jewish. The Jewish God-man speaking to 12 Jewish men, telling them that you will sit on 12 thrones with me, ruling and reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel from Israel, because that's where the Lord's throne is, is in Jerusalem, Israel. So obviously this is a very Jewish thing, but it's making it very clear that God has a plan for Israel. There's going to be a nation called Israel that's going to need judging during the millennial age when he is sitting on his throne on this earth judging. Okay, so I think we, we all have to admit there is a plan for Israel that is earthly, that, that the twelve... Uh, Talmudim, followers of the Lord, will be raised up and judge with him over the 12 tribes. That's a specific area. Now, that's not just the little slice called Israel today. That's Israel in her fullness, all the land God promised her. The parameters are seen in Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 15 and verse 18, where it goes from the Mediterranean, it goes all the way to the Euphrates, where it takes in part of Egypt and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and Iran and you know, it's huge, the area. But that area will be divided among the 12 tribes. And then there will be these that are sitting and rolling and judging over that geographical area. Okay, we're going to see more of that, but I think I've laid down good groundwork for now. <clears throat> Go with me to Yeshia, Isaiah, chapter 1. The very first chapter, we're going to go to verses 26 and 27. Isaiah, chapter 1. Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 26, whoops, and 27. And I just sent my tablet all the way off. Oh, that's what I did. Okay, got it back. This is God speaking through Isaiah, Yeshua the prophet. Then I will restore your judges as at first, and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Well, and it goes on, verse 27, the first word is, is Zion, Zion. Zion will be redeemed with justice. We know Zion refers either to Jerusalem or to all of Israel. So if it's talking about a faithful city called Zion, we know that is Jerusalem. When will Jerusalem be called a city of righteousness? When will it be a faithful city? Has it been in all of its history, going back to the time that, that David set up his rule from Jerusalem? No. It's never been. It has good people in it that have done right, but it's never been a whole righteous city, a faithful city, a city where God has restored the judges and the counselors as he had from the beginning. So this is showing that a judge's office in ancient issue in, in ancient Israel wasn't judicial but administrative. They're administrating. They are working out the plan of the Lord. They represented God to the nations. Okay, now I'm sure there'll be judging that takes place in the same way as judges today, but we have administrative judges that carry out the law of the land. 
they're going to be carrying out the law of God. Okay? Let me go to Judges 2.18, and I want to do it out of this. Judges was a time when there were judges, but this time of Israel was not when she was right before God. She cycled. She would get right with God, and then she'd forget her God, and she'd go off into to sin, false idolatry, and God would allow her to, to go into um, some sort of captivity or punishment again to awaken her and bring her back. 600 years it cycled. In Judges 2 and verse 18 we read, And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge, delivered them out of the hand of the enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented of the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them who had oppressed them and vexed them. The same thing we saw with Egypt. When they really cried out, moaned and groaned to God, put their eyes back on God, were saying, you know, we need you, God. We're, we're, we realize we sinned. We were wrong. That's when God's able to redeem them again, bring them back, put them under a judge that, that would be fair and good, and things would be good again. But unfortunately, like a lot of people, when they're in that foxhole, when they're in trouble, they cry out to God, make their, their plans, you know, if you do this, God, if you spare me, God, I'll serve you all the days of my life. And a month later, where do we find them? Living the life they were living before. Well, that's kind of the pattern we see here with Israel, is that repeatedly she did the same thing and she would be... Um, some, into some sort of somebody over her who would make life miserable so she'd realize she needed her God again and cry out to her God. Um, and again, the judges that God raised up, this is before the time of the kings. There was a king over the land of Israel, the theocratic king. Who am I talking about? God, he himself. He wanted to be their king. When they cried out for an earthly yeah. king, they Samuel made it clear, you had a king. You didn't want him. The king that they didn't want was God. They wanted one with skin on, sitting on an earth where they could see him, and they got what they asked for. Yeah. Like of all I wish bed. we had God for our, for our king. <laughs> we do in the sense he has the final word. But in that same way that there were judges under King Jehovah, there will be judges under King Yeshua in the tribulation. Okay, mm -hmm. Administering, representing God to the nation. And so we see um, that promised also, the, the resurrection there. Um, the 12 will be resurrected now. I've got to clarify because someone's going to think it and say it. Well, wait a minute. Judas was one of them. Yes. Judas will not be raised to judge. He, did, he was condemned. We know that. He was called the son of perdition. So obviously he is not. But again, there are exceptions to the rule. And there was... Uh, one who was put in the place, the twelfth disciple, because they felt they had to have twelve. Mattathias is the one who the, the, um, they cast lots, who it fell on. There are those who believe it will be him. There are those who believe that shouldn't have been done. The position should have been left open for the Apostle Paul, that he should have been the twelfth, and that it will be Paul put into that position. I'll tell you the answer as soon as we're in the millennium. <laughs> I'll tell you the answer when we're in the millennium. Oh, okay. In other words, scripture doesn't make <laughs> it clear. I always thought it would be Paul too, Okay. But I guess it's not. It may be and it may not be. Okay. <laughs> because they did put a twelfth one into position. But again, scripture doesn't make it clear, so I'll tell you when we see God play it out. Okay. <laughs> see, that's the thing. Scripture don't make it too clear, so... You just kind of have to wing it <laughs> on certain on things. On certain things. Anything that matters, mm -hmm. Scripture's crystal clear. Mm -hmm. If it matters, the answer's there. If it mm -hmm. does not matter, then then God allows us room to dig, room to use our minds, room to, to grow in a relationship with Him. And we have to remember, we could never attain the full knowledge of God. No matter no. what. So even the parts we think we understand, there's still more that we're, that's we're right. missing. That's but right. everything we yeah. need, we've got. That's that's the beauty of our Lord. So let me take us from this because it fits into this. We're going to keep talking some about the resurrection and who's been resurrected. Um, and in our, I'm, I'm deciding which way to go because what I want to bring to you is Israel regathered and I want to bring to you the judgments. Let me give you Israel regathered first. Because at the very end of the tribulation, the Lord has returned. He's out of his mouth has come the sword that has slain the enemies of Israel. The Antichrist has been stopped dead in his tracks. 
Don't you love it? He's dead. Okay, let me show you. Let's go real quick. Whoops, I've got it already here. Revelation 19. Okay, we've talked about 19. Even last week we talked about it. That, uh, And we're going to go over 19 again when we hit the marriage supper of the Lamb. All of this is fitting together. I just have to stretch it out because I run out of class time. In verse 7 of Revelation 19, it's saying, let us rejoice and be glad. Let us give him the glory for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb. Okay, the marriage of the Lamb. We'll talk about that when we get to that topic. His bride has prepared herself. Fine linen and bright and clean has been given to her to wear. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, when we drop down to verse 14, we have the armies of heaven that come out with the Lord when he returns to the earth in between 7 and 14. We have the armies clothed in fine linen, white and pure, following him on the white horses. So we know verse 7 and verse 14 are talking about the same group. They're described exactly the same way. We know that that's the armies that come out of heaven with him, and we know that it says that we come out with him, okay? The armies of heaven come with him. Verse 15, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, okay? He strikes against all who have come against Israel. Um, you can keep reading. Um, verse 19, I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, the kings of the earth, their armies, all who align themselves with Antichrist gathered together to do battle with the rider of the horse, the one who came out of heaven, the one who has the name faithful and true, the one who's wearing the crown of righteousness. We know it's the Lord. So the beast and all of the kings that are with him, all his armies, are trying to do battle against the Lord and against his army. What happens? Verse 20. The beast was taken captive. With it, and I love it, just calls him an it. With it, the false prophet, who in its presence had done the miracles which had, he had used to deceive those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. Remember, Satan's false trinity is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The false prophet did miracles that helped the people believe in the Antichrist and pledge their allegiance to Antichrist and go along with the Antichrist. He was the Antichrist's right-hand man. He's considered just as guilty as the Antichrist in this. The beast and the false prophet both were taken. And what happens to them? Um, and if I read it in your New American, it might make more sense to those of you who are used to that language. These two, the beast and the false prophet, these two, verse, the second part of verse 20, were thrown alive into the lake a fire which burns with brimstone. You want a description of hell? It's a lake of fire that burns with brimstone. The Antichrist and the false prophet are another exception to God's role. We do not see them stand before God at the great white throne judgment to be judged for their actions and to receive what they get because of their actions. They, remember the Monopoly game? Go to jail. Go directly to jail. <laughs> do not pass go. Do yep, not yep. collect $200. <laughs> they go straight to hell. Do That's not right. stop. Do not pass go. They don't. God finds them so vehement, evil. so evil, mm -hmm. that he does not bring them up for judgment on how bad or how good mm -hmm. and weigh things out. They're evil personified. They're evil in their totality, and they are thrown in the lake of fire forever. That's what happens to these two. The rest were killed with the sword that goes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. What's the sword that comes out of the Lord, out of his mouth? Do you think it's a literal sword and that he went and chopped off heads? No, it's, no, the, word it's the word of God. The word of God is like a sword, sharper and powerful than a two-edged sword. Out of his mouth, he annihilates. Out of his mouth, he created. Out of his mouth, he destroys. Mm -hmm. So the enemies are all destroyed. Those bodies apparently lay on this earth in the beginning of the, the tribulation. I'm sorry, the beginning of the millennium. We'll talk about that as we get into the millennium. But notice, all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. We're going to talk about that in more detail when we get to that point very soon. All this comes very soon in my in my teaching. But we know that the birds are gathered to the great supper or the supper of the great God. Either way, it's a great meal for them. There's going to be so many 
that the ravenous birds, the ones that eat flesh, are going to come and pick those bones clean. If they didn't, the, the stench and the sicknesses that would be on the face of the earth, God doesn't allow that during the millennium. Sorry. Remind me to open it if it gets too warm before you uh, took one kitty out. <laughs> um, the, but we know that the beginning of the millennium, they're burning the weapons of war, the flesh is being clean, there's going to be men that are going through that it's their job to bury those bones. The, it, others aren't to touch the bones. Again, disease and all of that is still. The millennium doesn't start as heaven on earth where everything's perfect and there's no sickness and, and all of that. No, it's got to be cleaned up and it's not heaven on earth. It's the rule of heaven on earth. Mm. And that will be right and just and fair. But if people step out of line, they will lose their life during the, trip, during the millennial period. So we see, you know, there are still consequences and things that go on on the face of this earth. It's not a perfect earth. Not yet. That will come later, okay? A lot of people think that they think the earth has to be perfect, but we'll see as we talk more about it that the earth is not. These bones then are buried by the men who it's their job to do it because they know how to handle it. They, they'll have the, the ability to handle it without it, it causing disease to them. It's yours. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll see uh, that, that finally there'll be a time when there won't be any more dead bodies, but I think it takes seven months to build, to burn the weapons of war and to bury the bodies. Mm. Don't quote me, we'll get there, but mm. I, it's something like seven months into mm. the millennial period. Okay, so now we know this earth is rid of the Antichrist, it's rid of the false prophet. We're going to see at the end of the millennium, we're going to see that we get a look into hell at that point, and we're going to see that's where the beast and the false prophet are. That means they don't go in there and they're burned up and it's done and it's over. That means, just like we're taught, heaven is eternity. Hell is eternity. It's not for a time. If it says that, that we have everlasting life, we have everlasting life. We either have it with the Lord or apart from the Lord. Um, but it's not annihilation. It's not burned up and gone. That's... When you think of that, you realize how horrible that is to suffer forever out of the presence of the loving God. But when you see what they've done, and you see them as an enemy of our Lord, they're going to only receive what they deserve. What more can we say? So Now are the lost that, that doesn't make it in, their bodies will burn forever and ever, and that's because they're made of a special substance too. They have this, the same way they became a living being. When God breathed into man, man became a living being. If you didn't hear a question, she's asking about the unsaved that, that are going to stand in judgment and then go into uh, hell also. What about them? Yes. They live on forever also because that breath of, of God that made anything alive that is alive does not... It, Desist, is that a word? It, it does. can't, it doesn't stop. So they it will, dies. it yeah. never dies, it yeah. never dies. But they'll live, and they will suffer in a way that is equal to their life. Mm -hmm. So that, again, like I've said so many times before, someone who really lived a good life really tried to help people. But still, we're going to see they still were an enemy of our Lord. They still denied him. They mm -hmm. still would not receive him they will still suffer the consequences of that decision forever. But someone like a Hitler, a Saddam Hussein, a Saad, mm -hmm. you know, Syria, who's mutilated and killed and found mm -hmm. joy in it, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're going to suffer more excruciatingly, I'll put it that way. In some way, it will be more excruciating for them than for these others. Better? I think so. Uh, okay. If you need a move, <laughs> if you need right a move, we'll get you to move. Pam's got the sun right in her eyeballs. Sorry. Um, just take the towel with you so that you don't get kitty fur that bother you. Okay. So we'll look now. Um, I think the best way to go is let's go into Israel being regathered, and then right on the heels of Israel being regathered, we'll go into the judgments that will go into who's going into the truth. I've got to quit saying that. Going into the millennium and who will not go into the, the millennium, what happens, okay? We'll get, go into all of that. But 
Israel being regathered is critically important to remember and to realize because God is not through with the nation of Israel. I can't say that loud enough and long enough. The church does not replace Israel. There is so much teaching out there that that says the opposite, that that's why you hear me. Yes, I'll get on my soapbox. God keeps his word. God doesn't change. God is faithful. When God makes an unconditional covenant with Israel, he keeps his word. So all the promises God made for Israel, he will fulfill. This is critical because, as I've said before, we as believers have been given certain promises. If God can turn his back on Israel and say, I'm taking back my promises, then God could do that to us today too. And we could find ourselves in a world of hurt and a world of insecurity. What if God changes his mind? Well, that isn't who God is. Scripture says Jesus and Jesus and God are equal. It's the same never yesterday, changes. today, and forever. He never breaks a promise. He never breaks his word. And he promised Israel to be regathered. He promised that she would always be a nation. He said, I'll make a full end of the nations that come against you, but I will never make a full end of you. Now, does that give Israel the right to, oh, well, then I can live as bad as I want. I don't, I don't have to care. No. Look at what God's done. Well, I don't want to say God's done to Israel, but allowed to happen in Israel's life. Has she gone into captivity? Has she gone into suffering? Is she even in a good place today? Yes and no. She is finally in somewhat of the land God promised her, but she's in it with 22 nations around her that want to destroy her. She lives a hard life now because she's still not yielded to her God. She's still not in right fellowship with him. So the blessings of God are not all over Israel. Yes, God is the only reason why she is in that land, but that's just the, the start. That's not the fulfillment of all sorry, <laughs> of all that uh, God has promised for her. But he's working out his perfect plan. He knew from beginning to end, and he's got it all. So let's look at this. Go with me to Matthew 24. How do I get rid of that? Matthew 24. One of my favorites. And a very familiar chapter. If you've been with me, we've been in it a lot. We're not going over the same portion, though. We're going to jump all the way down to verse 31. Remember, Matthew is in order, though. As you go through it, you see the layout of the tribulation in its order. You see the end of the tribulation. You see in verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky, the tribes of the land mourning when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with tremendous power and glory. So we know the second coming has happened. The Lord's come back in his glory. Verse 31. He will send out his angels or he sent forth his angels with a great trumpet blast and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other so by angelic hosts by the angels going out through the earth they are going to bring back in gathering from the four winds means from the north the south the east and the west from one end of the sky to the other they're going to be bringing back the children of Israel back into their land. Let me show you that from the original covenant promises. Yeshia, Isaiah 49, verse 22. Isaiah 49 and verse 22. <clears throat> Isaiah 49 and verse 22 says, this is what the Lord God says. Behold, remember when you see behold, pay attention, wake up, hello, don't miss this. I, God, I will lift up my hand to the nations, set up my flag to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. How far do I want to read? Maybe that's how far I want to read. It is. Okay, so the nations, because we know there's nations still. We know that when the Battle of Armageddon is fought, it's nations that have come up against Israel. We know that, that some of these nations, a full end is going to be made of them, but we are going to read about Egypt in the Millennial Kingdom. We're going to read about other nations. You will see that. Well, these nations, they're going to literally carry his sons and daughters back into the land of Israel. They're going to pick them up and help them get to the land. It sounds like physically. Um, 
definitely symbolically, but I think it could be physically, that they're not able to walk, I'll carry you. They're not able to, to handle it, get in my car, I'll take you. However they're going to do it, they're going to help the Israelis get back into the land. Chapter 60 and verse 9 of Isaiah. Chapter 60 and verse 9. Certainly the coastlands will wait for me. The ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar. The, their silver and their gold with them. So there's going to be Jewish people living in the, in the area of Tarsus. I believe that's Turkey, if I remember correctly. It's an area that Paul spoke of that, that he was in for a time. They're going to come on ships into Israel. The, when it says to bring your sons from afar, sons is generic. It doesn't mean just the men. With them, they're going to have silver and gold. They're going to be coming in with blessing. The, uh, for the name of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. He has brought glory to Israel. So they're going to come back and they're going to come back in blessing. They're going to come back with wealth. I see a taste of that when they left Egypt. Remember when they left Egypt? The Egyptians gave them their gold, gave them their silver. In essence, they were 200 years as slaves with no pay. They got their pay in the end when they left Egypt. God has his way of doing it. Go quickly to chapter 66 of Isaiah. In chapter 66, we're going to go to verse 20. Isaiah 66 and verse 20, and there we read, Then they shall bring all your countrymen from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord. They're going to come how? On horses, in chariot, chariots, sorry, in litters, on, on mules and on camels, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. So he's saying, just like Israel right now comes up to the temple, comes up to Jerusalem, brings their grain offering, well, they're going to come from all over, and they're going to come in all these different modes of transportation. Horses, <laughs> horses, chariots, that's a new one, maybe, maybe it's a chariot pulled by a horse, <laughs> anyway, litters, mules, camels, always, all, always are going to come to bring them back into the land of Israel, remember they've been scattered, we're going to see, I'll come up with a scripture that tells us, he who scatters them will gather them, but that's coming, let me show you from Zechariah, Another prophet to give you the testimony out of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Zechariah chapter 12, you've heard me read verse 10 over and over and over again, that this is when the Lord does return, they will see him coming back. When, the, when God in heaven speaking, I will pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of grace. Uh, they're pleading, he's pouring out his grace so that they will look on me, Yeshua, whom they have pierced. I've told, taught this so much, I'm just summarizing it. They will mourn for him like one mourns for the only son. Weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Now, we've read that continually. We've talked about they see the Lord coming in his glory. This is Israel that believes and is saved on that day. The morning in Jerusalem be like the great morning. And it, it talks about the morning from Hadad Dramon uh, in the plain of Megiddo all the way down. Remember, Armageddon is two-thirds of the land of Israel from north to south, geographically speaking. The land will mourn every family by itself, and it names them the house of David, of, of Nathan, Nathan, of Levi, um, the Shemites. It goes on and on. All the families that are left, every family by themselves, the wives by themselves. The wives have lost their husbands in in the tribulation, in, in the, the battles, in the war, even, it doesn't matter. He's saying all the families, whether they're con complete family or a partial family, they're all mourning. And verse uh, 1 of chapter 13 tells us when that day comes, when they, they're mourning because they realize that they regret that they did not accept him in his first coming, they're open to him in his second coming. That day comes, a spring will be opened, or a fountain you may have. Uh, for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Yerushalayim, for sin and defilement. That fountain that's open is, in essence, it's like a fountain. You could call it of water as in the water, the washing of the, the, okay, the word of God is the washing and the regeneration. 
I'm saying that poorly, but do you understand what I'm saying? I, I can't quite get that verse out. That the word of God is like um, the water that washes and regenerates. Or you could see this as a fountain of blood. That it's the blood of Yeshua Jesus that they're being bathed in because they're believing in this. And that that's going to be what takes away their sin and their defilement. Either way, I'm talking about it being through belief, through faith in Yeshua Jesus, who he is. He says out of the innermost beings would flow uh, rivers of living water. So you can use the symbolism of the water of the word that regenerates or the blood that was shed that regenerates. That's what's happening when he brings them back in. The fountain shows the cleansing, that they're being cleansed by the blood. They're being cleansed by the word of God. Now, at this time... As the ones who are seeing, we are looking at a nation. We are looking at a people that are living on this earth that are seeing it happen. Romans 11, Shaul Paul referred to this um, in, in his book. Uh, chapter 11, remember 9, 10, and 11 is Israel past, Israel future. I'm sorry. Boy, Michelle, come on, slow down. Chapter 9, Israel past. Chapter 10, Israel present. Chapter 11, Israel future. In chapter 10, we even see the grafting in of the Gentiles, that they're brought in to make the Jewish people jealous. Not a cutting off and destruction of the Jew, but a grafting in that allowed, it, it even refurbishes and brings back strength, and then the, the Jewish branches that believe are brought back in, one with the Gentiles. In chapter 11, Israel in the future, it tells us, in verse 26, it says, so all Israel will be saved. Okay, now notice specifically, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Yaakov. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God is speaking specifically here. He's telling that Israel, the Israel who will believe, they're the ones that will see the deliverer come. He's going to come right out of Jerusalem for him because he comes to Jerusalem and he works out from Jerusalem. He's going to remove sin. He's going to remove ungodliness. This is the covenant he made that with Israel, he would, would come that day finally with those who believe. He'd take away their sin and he would set up his kingdom. That's who is being saved. It's talking about a nation, a land, a people in that land that can be seen. It does not mean that every Jewish person will be saved because we know only the ones who turn to him, only the ones who believe in him, only the ones who personally accept him as Messiah are the ones who are saved. So it's a national because there's going to be a national restoration. There's going to be a literal temple set up in a literal Jerusalem from which he will bless the nation of Israel and all the other nations that come up will receive blessing also. They'll bring their offerings to the Lord. They'll go back home and their countries will receive rain. If they receive rain, they're growing crops. They're having food. They're being blessed. They bring their blessing into the temple. The blessing continues to flow for them. But Israel is where it's being brought into. Israel, as a nation, will be saved. All Satan has tried to do from the beginning of the Jewish nation is wipe them off the face of the map because he knows Messiah is to come back to the nation of Israel. If he annihilates Israel, if there is no more Israel, if he succeeds in pushing them into the Mediterranean Sea, which is what the enemy says they want to do with Israel right now, then he will have one. There will be no Israel for the Lord to come back to. Mm -hmm. But we know this will never happen because God said, no, I will never make a full end. I'm going to come back to Jerusalem. I'm going to set up my, my kingdom there from Jerusalem. This is the covenant that I made with them. I will take away their sins. Now, the only ones he takes away sin from are those who are open to that. He doesn't force himself on anyone, and any who have not believed will not be a part of this. But the believers are the ones that will see this national restoration of the land of Israel. Remember, can a nation be born in a day? We go back to Isaiah 66 for that, and we see a fulfillment 
1948, but we are going to see the greater fulfillment in the future. Isaiah 66, verse 7 says, Before she was in labor, she delivered. Boy, I don't know a pregnant mom that doesn't want to claim this verse and have the kid before they have the labor pains. It doesn't go that way. But with the, be with, nice. Yeah, be nice. But with God, it does work that way. Before her pain, she gave birth to a boy. Okay, do you remember Revelation 12? The woman gave birth to the male child. Here it calls him a boy. Israel gave birth to the Messiah in his flesh before the coming tribulation period of labor pains. Remember, the, the tribulation is referred to as birth pains, the birth pains that bring on the Messiah. The tribulation is a cleaning of the earth to prepare it for the coming of Messiah, specifically from Israel, but going out from there. So when, when we read in verse 7 that she gave birth to a boy, we're talking about his first coming. Who has seen such a thing? Who has seen? Who has heard such a thing? Can a land be born in a day? Here's where we begin to see a near fulfillment with a greater fulfillment. When Israel became a nation in a day. Basically she was reborn in a day because Israel never ceased to exist. It's just she was not in control of her own land. But she's always been, there's always been a Jewish remnant. There's never been a time when there wasn't a Jew living on the face of the earth once God started the Jewish race. So, the nation, can, can a nation be given birth all at once? Yes, 1948, Israel suddenly became reborn again. But we also know that we're going to see the greater when Messiah returns and suddenly in a day sets Israel up from being the epitome of the earth, from being trampled under foot. Remember it says that, that Jerusalem will be trampled under foot. From that to being the head nation of the world in Jerusalem, the head place, the, the, the place of the throne of Messiah, that's going to happen in a day. That's going to happen when the Lord returns to the battle of Armageddon, stops that, and sets up his kingdom. So we get a foreshadowing through her birth in 1948, but we'll get a complete fulfillment in the millennium. As soon as Zion, Zion was in labor, she also delivered her sons. Israel will deliver the Jewish people to Messiah in, in the day when the nation is restored. That's what we're reading about here. Drop down to verses 20 and 21 in the same chapter. It says, Then they shall bring all your countrymen. Your countrymen are the Jewish people. They're called lancemen. They're called kinsmen. Countrymen here. Then they shall bring all your countrymen from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord. Remember how we read this? On horses, chariots, litters, mules, camels, they're all coming. Where are they coming? They're coming to a specific place called my holy mountain. And if you don't know what that is, it goes on and it says, Jerusalem. Just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, I will also take some of them as priests and Levites. He's going to reestablish the temple worship. He's going to take some of the Jewish people who are being brought back in in return, and he's going to make them priests and Levites to serve the Lord in his millennium temple, excuse me. So we go all the way from the first coming in view in verse 7 to the fulfillment of his second coming. Um, Zion travailing. Let me show you also the tribulation was to bring forth, is the birth pains to bring forth. That's Jeremiah, Jeremiah, and again he agrees with Isaiah completely. So we have another witness here, Jeremiah chapter 30. We're going to look at verses, whoops, 6 and 7. I typed it wrong. Let me get there. Come on, let me in. Jeremiah, there we go. Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 and 7. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his waist as a woman in childbirth? And why have all their faces turned pale? What's this saying? This is saying, you know, can you imagine a man giving birth? The woman goes through the pain of childbirth, and the man sees how horrible it is, and he shies away from it. I even heard a pastor talk about it this morning, that he was with his wife at the birth of all four of their children. And he said, I won't take it lightly, but he says, I won't say another word, because I don't know what that's like. <laughs> well, God is comparing that, and he's saying it is so bad. The birth pains are so bad, bringing about the birth of Israel, that it's like a man writhing in pain, a man trying to take birth. <coughs> 
and their faces are, are pale, they're <coughs> suffering so greatly. Whoa, for that day is great. There's none like it. The tribulation is so bad. It's like a man trying to, to give, give birth and he can't handle it. There's none like it. It's the time of Jacob's distress. Troubles. The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Jacob, in this case, is Israel. It's referring to Israel. This is the time of Israel's trouble. All these birth pains that are horrible and are happening. It is Israel's distress. It's happening in the land of Israel. It's happening to the nation of Israel. She's being trampled underfoot. The Antichrist is trying to annihilate every Jew. Christian too, but every Jew. We're seeing it come against them with a the vendetta. They're going to hunt down the Jews to kill them. They're going to hunt down the believers to kill them too. But notice he's talking to Israel here in Jeremiah. He's not talking to the church. There is no church at this point. There's no church on earth in the tribulation either. And what does it say about Israel? Yet he, Israel, will be saved out of it. Or be saved. Mm -hmm. This says from it, but the, the original language, it really gives the idea of being saved out of it. God is going to allow Israel to go into a time of childbirth a time of travail, a time of suffering, the way this earth has never seen it. Israel will not be alone. The world suffers the tribulation. But for Israel, it's birth pangs bringing on the Messiah, bringing on this glorious coming of our Lord in fulfillment. When that woman finally gives birth to that baby, they put that baby on her chest in an instant. She forgets all that pain. She's even willing to go through it again and again to have more children because she forgets all the pain for the joy of what she has. The joy of Israel, her Messiah, comes out of those birth pangs. That's why it's referring to it being Jacob's trouble. And it is, again, to get Israel to turn her eyes to her God so that she will look and she will see the one who was pierced and believe in him and say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is what we are seeing. Um, Some says we're in the birth pain now, but we're not because you just explained it would be with Israel. True, but the same way that there's the uh, Braxton, the fake birth mm -hmm. pains. Braxton Hicks. Braxton Hicks, thank you. I knew I was off on the word. The same way that those feel very real and they are precursor to, we're mm -hmm. definitely in precursor. We're definitely seeing the beginning of but, but the actual is not here because the actual is in the tribulation. Like Dr. McGee said, though, when you drive into a mountain, before you get into the mountain, the shadow falls on you. Oh, okay. You feel that shadow. Yeah. The sun isn't as clear. It usually the temperature drops. You feel the beginning effects. Mm -hmm. You're not into it fully. I can attest this because I'm one who doesn't like cold. And we're, we're leaving the heat on a summer day down here. We drive up, and when we hit the foothill of the mountain, which we hit very quickly from where I live, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's already 10 degrees cooler. Mm -hmm. It already begins to feel good and refreshing, but we're noticing a difference. If we go all the way up the mountain and get to the mountain top, depending on what the weather's up there, I may be putting a sweater on because it's cold. Yes. I didn't feel that cold down here, but as I approached, I began to feel it. As we're approaching, we're beginning to feel. We've got the fake birth pains. We've got an idea. So we're in the shadow. Of, of we're in the, the shadow. Pain. We're in the shadow. Let me give you the greatest shadow I think this earth has seen. Okay? And I'll call it out. This pandemic. For the first mm -hmm. time, yeah. the world is living with something that's happening all over the world. That's right. It hasn't been that way before. The Holocaust right. was in an area. People didn't want the United States to get involved. Oh, that's Europe. That's over there. It's not our fight. We'll leave it alone. Mm -hmm. You can't say that about the pandemic. It mm -hmm. started it's over there, over. but it's our fight too. Yes. And our fight is affecting those in another country. Mm -hmm. We've got one here that wants to return to Australia. Can't get there because Australia is saying, United States, uh-uh. We're not letting you in because you're too infected. We don't right. want it back here in Australia. We've pretty much damped it down, down. Yeah, dampened it down. We don't want it back. Okay, the world has never seen anything like this before. Oh. If you would have said to me, even a month before the, this pandemic started, that America will put on masks to go anywhere, will mainly isolate in their homes, will stop going to services, and many won't even have their jobs to go to, I would have said, yeah, right. 
Okay, maybe in the tribulation. Well, guess what? It came sooner, and it's a precursor. It's a wake-up call. Yes, it's it to let the world know. Yes, when we as Christians have been saying to the world, hey, there's coming a time of tribulation that this whole world is going to suffer. And they've yeah. scoffed at us. Yeah, right. Sure. Guess what? Now they're beginning to listen to us. Hey, you said there'd be something worldwide. Uh -huh. What else do you say is coming? Mm-hmm. They're getting curious. They're getting curious. And the more they get curious, hopefully the more they will look into the scriptures because right. they need it. If they don't believe before we go in rapture and they find themselves in the, the tribulation, it's, this pandemic's going to be a, a joy ride compared to what it will be like then. But they can get into the Word of God. They can see what is going to come. They can plan for what is coming, and they can do what they need to do to try to survive it. Some will be able to. We'll talk about those. Many will not be able to. Okay, so the tribulation is, it's not, it, some people like to say, oh, this is God mad at Israel and whipping Israel. No, it's not. The world will suffer these consequences. Israel does go through the birth pangs to bring on the Messiah. But it is not God mad at Israel and, and pouring out like that. He does say his wrath is poured out on the sin on the face of this earth. And when those, those seals are open, when the, the bowls are poured out, when it is the wrath of God, it is on sin, and it is affecting the entire world, including Israel. Israel doesn't get a get-out-of-jail-free card, but she's not being picked on by God and beat up by God. That's not what's going on here. But God, in his justice and his fairness and his righteous rule, does say about sin, enough is enough. Your cup of iniquity is full. I am now pouring out my wrath on that sin and its consequences do come and it will be put to an end. So God deals fairly and rightly, but Israel that does not believe beforehand is not spared what is coming on the face of this earth. Okay, so the children are a picture of, you know, the male child was brought forth by Israel uh, the children are the nations restored in a day at his second coming. The children are brought back, okay, the children of Israel. Remember, one of the purposes of the tribulation is to bring forth Israel's kingdom. It is to get that world to that point that Israel's kingdom does come, okay? Okay. Um, I'm thinking I probably ought to stop here because I've got a number of references that we'll go through. Um, the, the threshing out, the harvesting, the specific places that are mentioned, specific countries that Israel will return from are mentioned. So I've got enough scripture. I, I don't think I could do it in five minutes. I think I'm too tongue-tied today. If I try to race, I'm just throwing too much at you. Um, so we'll pick back up next week and look at other verses that show Israel being regathered from the four corners of the earth. I'll give you more scripture to prove that. I'll give it to you from Isaiah, from Jeremiah, from Ezekiel, from Amos. Um, that might be about it. But I think that's enough. That, that's, you know, enough to prove my point. Then we will look at the judgments. The judgments we're going to see, there are Gentile judgments and there are Jewish judgments. And these judgments will, what comes out of it is who goes into the kingdom and who does not. So we're going to look at scripture next week when we get there. Um, I'll make you curious. Many people use these scriptures and they apply them in a different way in a different time. I'll let you decide whether they've applied them right or whether we are right when we show them in relation, the second coming in relation to Israel. The same way that I took you through the, the verses in Matthew 24 where many put the rapture there. And I said, you know, remember, we're, we're talking about Israel's plan. We see the, the tribulation end, and we see the coming, the second coming, not the rapture. So those verses are the setting up for the second coming. We're going to carry that thought all the way through because we're not inconsistent. That thought is what you're going to need to permeate as you follow my study next week, that we are not talking to the church we are not talking about the rapture. We are talking about the second coming of Messiah to 
Israel. He came the first time to Israel. He's coming the second time. And when you see that, then these scriptures are going to line up. The judgments are going to fit. And you will see who goes into the kingdom and who doesn't and why. But we're not talking about rapture. We are talking about millennial kingdom and missing out on that. Um, and we'll go further. We won't get there next week, but we'll go further and see um, what happens to the ones who do not go into the kingdom. We'll get into the judgment that comes later. We've already mentioned it, the second resurrection and that sort of thing. We're close. Even though we lost a little time to question today, those questions were important. We need to understand that we are starting to move where it won't be a whole lot longer before we're into eternity future. So we just may beat the coming of the Lord. We may not because he could come in rapture today. <laughs> so I will definitely beat the second coming because if we don't know it down here, we'll learn it up there. <laughs> but um, are there any questions or comments? Um, I know I stumbled a lot over my words. So I hope I made it clear today. If in your thinking that you come up with, um, you know, a question, something, Text it to me, call me, get it to me ahead of time so that I can pick up with that at the start next week because we want a good foundation. Remember, we're taking things in order, and so we're building on this orderliness of the Word of God. Okay, Rhonda, is that a question or a comment? Go right ahead. I, I want you to know, how we've been doing Zoom since around March of this year, right? Yes. And every time class begins... My dog runs to this room to beat me to class. And I promise you, class is supposed to be over around 3.30. Around 3.35 or 3.40, she gets antsy and jumps on me to say, shouldn't class be over? I'm going to show you first. Well, it <laughs> was. And yes, she's <laughs> right. And my kids got a little impatient, too. <laughs> she loves, she yeah. loves the Bible. That's right. Like every time yeah. she complains around 3.35 and 3.40, <laughs> the class should be she, over. She said, that's every enough. That's since enough. Since March. Since March. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, we know who created her. She loves her creator. <laughs> and he has a plan for her, too. But that's her own. I love it. I love it. And sure. So, what the tribulation? At, at the, the rapture, you I mean, mean in the rapture. Yes, yes. I, I, I trust. I, for those of you who worry about your pets in the rapture, remember the rapture is God's day. <coughs> trust your pets to a God who loves. That's what I have to do, too. You know, it's not man's doing the man. It is God's doing, so. I absolutely think that the animals go to heaven. When fine with me. He created them. God, and God's got a perfect and plan. Them. And there are animals in heaven. We do know that. Yes, Roger. And we come back with Jesus Christ on what? Horses. 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 So now, horses some say that's animals. not literal, but I do believe that we see when we see in heaven, we are seeing. Heaven's not just the streets of gold. If you think that's all heaven is, open up your mind and look at scripture again. Heaven is humongous. And there are fields, and, and there's flowers, and there's colors, and I believe there are literal animals mentioned also. You know, there's so much. Heaven is more, not less than. Heaven is greater, not a less than, so. Mm. I hope in heaven I have more counter space. <laughs> <laughs> I have two bathrooms with hardly no counter space, and everything falls in the sink. Pam wants it. more counter space in her bathroom, so her things don't fall in the sink. That's why we're laughing. Yeah, you're not going to need to put on makeup. We'll, yeah, you're not going right. to need to stand. Right. We won't yeah. need any of that you're stuff. You're not going to need to take a shower in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying that this morning when my stuff fell in the sink, I said, well, when I get my home in heaven, I won't need any of this stuff. I'll do you one better, Pam, because you clean houses down here. You don't have to clean your house in heaven either. There you go, there you go. <laughs> and I don't mean because she does that down here. I mean that'll mean something to her because she is a, a house cleaner. No cleaning in heaven. It's, it's clean, it's sparkly, it's beautiful. <laughs> my friend said, said, well, when the rapture hits, you'll probably be cleaning and I'll be having a political party. She hates throwing poli political parties with her husband. He's all into that stuff. She says, we'll be doing that, the things we don't like that much, and we won't have to do it no more. <laughs> well, I've been on the opposite end because I've been with the Lord. I would like to go out in a blaze of glory for him, which means I'm either teaching 
or I'm witnessing for him. I want to be doing one of those two when yeah, I go home. Me too. So if I want that to happen, Michelle. I need to up my chances. What that means I need to teach teaching. more. <coughs> what are you not well, teaching? You know, but I mean, there, <laughs> there, there are times. Teaching. She's got to go when she's teaching. There are times I so eat. Of it. There are times I sleep. <laughs> you're still, you're still crazy with teaching when you're doing those things. I have to admit, I had to laugh at myself. I'm not one to remember dreams. I'm not one to, to you know, be mm. able to pull that out. But I came to one morning not long ago, I came to in the middle of my dream, you know, I'm coming to and I realized I was really telling somebody how to get saved. And I thought, go girl, even in your dreams, share it. Yeah, I don't remember any of my dreams I have either. I do. I used to when I was small, but young, but not now that I'm back older. Back to point. Yeah, back to point, because I've got people that are needing to go. Yeah. Um, I think Rhonda just left, did she? she Things pop around when somebody leaves. She did. She put up a heart of love. I think I, her doggy made her go, remember? <laughs> she probably has to take her doggy out. Anyway, any other quick comments before we close in prayer? <clears throat> okay. I hope it's been a blessing to you. It has been to me. It's Thank my joy. Yeah. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for giving us sweet fellowship at your feet. Thank you for letting us glean from your word today. Lord, we pray that only truth was spoken here, whatever was, that the Holy Spirit will bring that back to remembrance, that it will burn into our souls and our minds and to our very beings, that it will encourage us your hand of control, your perfection, your bringing good out of evil, your plan being totally to the nth degree carried out as you have ordained it to be. Lord, let us remember that when kings rise and kings fall, when we like and when we don't like, let us remember you are on the throne, you are in control, and one day the day will come when we will be home with you forever, and these plans that you have planned for Israel will be her joy too. Thank you, Lord. Fill our hearts with joy as we recall now and remember these wonderful things. And Lord, be with each one, keeping them safe until that, that moment when you do take us home. Thank yes. you for that precious promise that is ours. In your holy name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you. Like I say, my privilege. I love it. So thank you. Thank you.